Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Who's here for the first time? Anybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. God bless you. This morning, I want to speak to you about something that is vitally important. It's something that we all have in a way, but a lot of us also don't have in a different way. The thing that I want to talk to you about today is vision. Now, unless you're here today and you're blind, you do have some kind of vision. And but what I mean by that is you have the ability to see. I mean, you can all see Eddie standing here by the camera, right? Okay. And you can all see the people around you. But there is another way of expressing the word vision that is crucially important. And the word vision can also imply knowing where to go. Having a vision for your life. Having a vision to get from where you are now to where you would like to be. How many of you know that it's not God's plan for you to be where you are right now for the rest of your life, wherever that might be, physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever. God wants you to go forward. Just now when I was opening in prayer, <clears throat> I quoted Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. To give you a hope, to give you a future. All right, God has something in your future. What God has according to Him, and I'm using His words, is good. It's to prosper you. But you must understand that your future lies somewhere ahead of you. Your past lies somewhere behind you. I'll give you one reason why a lot of people battle to go forward in life. Vision means you see what God wants you to see. Where does all your problems, disappointments, failures, disasters, where are they? Are they in front of you or are they behind you? Look at your neighbor and say, it's all behind you. Because none of you can sit here and say to me, listen, I'm going to fail dismally tomorrow. Because you don't know what tomorrow holds, only God knows. And if something has convinced you that you're going to fail dismally tomorrow, then I want to tell you, you've got a devil lying to you because how can he prove that to you? He doesn't know. You see, what he wants you to do is he wants you to accept that word and he wants you to start thinking and fearing that because the Bible also says, Job 3.25, what you fear will come upon you. So if I walk around with this thing on me that I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I've just started a new business, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, guess what? It's going to fail. But is it failing because I am inadequate? Is it failing because I am useless? Or is it failing because I am giving the devil place by what I have received? Where's your vision? Your vision is focused on failure. Your vision is where you're going. If your vision is focused on failure, you are going to fail. I'm walking towards failure. I cannot be successful. How can God prosper you when you're, you're what is the word ingesteld? When you tuned in to failure. And you see, this is why it's important for us to talk about these things because we have to understand that God wants you to have vision. And God is actually quite particular about where He wants your vision to be. And maybe when you listen to my message today, you are also going to realize that one of the problems that you have in your life is that your vision is not where it is supposed to be. Because you must understand, there's a lot of places where I can be looking right now. And not all of them are going to be conducive to happy living. I can be looking at some stuff that's going to create big problems in my life right now. God cares about where your focus... Uh, today I will be using the word focus and vision interchangeably. I mean the same thing. Sometimes the word focus just shows that's what you need to, that's what you need to focus on. I think by now we all know the importance of vision. Without it, simple things become difficult things. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a demonstration. You know that I've done this before, but there's new people here that haven't seen it, and it actually works well. What's your name, my son? Julian. 
you've got a, a good self-image, whatever. I mean, you, know, you, you look quite well-rounded. You're not going to get too stressed, are you? Can, come and join me in the front, yeah. But if you do, I'll pray for you about all of that stuff later. All right, you're going to be fine. This is Julian, nice strapping young man. Um, how old are you now, Julian? You're 21, about to be 22. You have a girlfriend? I have to ask because all the girls are checking you out. Yeah. <laughs> they want to cause problems here, you know. All right, there's his girlfriend, ladies. They can, spoken for. All right, so Julian, I want you and I to show them something very practical that by the time they leave here, I want them to remember that and I never want them to forget. If I ask you to pick up that, uh, that water there, is it difficult? Do it for me quickly. Well done, boy. Did you notice the first thing he did before he took a step? His eyes went down, he saw the bottle, and he never took his eyes off the bottle. What do we call that? Focus. Vision. All right. Now, close your eyes. Keep them closed. Let's do this. You know what life is like? Trials, tribulations, problems, issues, drama, mother-in-laws. Etc., 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 etc. And so life goes on, and then suddenly we stop. You can't open your eyes, fetch the bottle. Try for me. <laughs> What's different? What's different? Only one thing changed. He still has his mobility, he's still strong, he's still good looking, but his vision disappeared. What was such a simple task before? became an impossible task when he lost his vision. The moment your vision is not where God wants it to be, thank you, God bless you. The moment your vision is not where God wants your vision to be, I want to tell you something, everything in your life turns upside down. It's one of the biggest reasons why some people go nowhere and other people seem to get everything done. You know, many times we do get upset with other people, like, oh, oh, you know, God's got favorites. Oh, you know, some things are so easy for some people and it's so difficult for others. Take a note of where the vision and the focus of that person is. If it's on the right things, then how can they not be blessed? Because difficult things become simple and easy when your focus and your vision is where God wants it to be. The Bible agrees wholeheartedly. Vision is crucial, but where vision is focused is just as important. There's a very wise man that speaks to us from the Bible. You all know him as Solomon. He was a king, and he had the opportunity to ask God for anything. I mean, how amazing would it be if you could ask God for anything? The thing about him, what made him special was, he didn't ask for status, he didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for material things. He had a very bright moment. I think he already had a lot of wisdom. Because he spoke with wisdom when he said to God, I want to be wise. You see, he realized that if he is to rule, he's going to have to make a lot of decisions that will affect other people. And if he doesn't have vision, if he doesn't have wisdom, how can he do that and still be a good leader? God blessed him with wisdom that was out of this world. You know, many times when he spoke, it was the Spirit of God speaking through him. Because the Spirit of God is also the Spirit of wisdom. Now Solomon gives us some insight into this. Proverbs 4 verse 23 to 27. He says the following. He says, above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. What is he talking about? Focus and vision. He says, now that you know where to go, that's the only thing that matters. You don't look this way. You don't look that way. And when the devil comes to remind you of the past, you refuse to go there. Why do some people go around in circles? Because when you try and go forward by looking backwards, that's what happens. You go around 
in circles. A lot of people have not dealt with their pasts. A lot of people's focus, instead of being in the future where God wants it to be, instead of being on the vision God has given them for their life, it's on their past failures. It's on what somebody said to them, how somebody treated them, what somebody did or didn't do for them. And in the spirit world, your spirit man is looking backwards. Therefore, in the natural, you cannot go forwards. You look like this. You go around in circles. What happens when we go around in circles all the time? You become disorientated. Very good. What else? Okay, in other words, your circumstances never change. How often do people say to me, oh, things have been like this for the last 10 years, the last 15 years, nothing ever gets any better. Well, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but the one question we have to ask is, have you not been going around in circles? And if you're going around in circles, what's causing that? You see, if nothing ever changes, you become frustrated, you become irritated, you feel disillusioned, you become hopeless. Who wants you to be like that? Well, there's only one thing that wants you to be like that. It's the devil. The devil wants you to be like that because then you never going to get to the place God has for you. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. And take only ways that are firm. Do not, listen to this, this is amazing. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your feet from evil. What's he saying there? He says the more you allow the enemy to take your focus either to the right or to the left, the more you will follow the way of evil. You see, there's always things out there that wants your attention. There's always things that's going to demand that you must give your attention this way or that way, even though you know where God wants you to go. God says the moment you listen to that voice, you are following the way of evil. Do you see that? God's word is very clear about where your focus should be. Look at your neighbor and say, straight ahead of you. There are many distractions in life that will try to get your focus shifted from where God is sending you, either to the right or to the left. Things like temptation, jealousy, envy, lies, other people's achievements, discontent, despair, the issues, the turmoil, the problems of life, all these things want you to put your focus squarely on that. But whenever you do, you're looking either left or right. You're not looking where God wants you to be. God wants you to establish your direction straight ahead. And God says to us, keep going that way. Have a destination and live your life in a way that pleases God. What is the number one thing we should be focused on? Did you read my notes? It looks like she did. Living a life that pleases God. When I live a life that pleases God, I am focused on one thing. That will get me to where I need to go. Nothing else is going to get you. When you please people, you fail. How many of you have realized that it's useless to please people because there are people out there that can never be pleased? There are people out there that you've given your everything for and tomorrow they turn their back on you or they tell you that it wasn't good enough. You see, forget about people. Please God. When you live a life to please God, all the other things are going to begin to fall into place. The wrong people will get pushed out of your life. The right people will come into your life because God takes charge of your life. Because you're beginning to move towards the destiny that God has for you. Do not be a people pleaser. Be a God pleaser. Do not live your life to impress other people because there's so many people out there that will never be impressed. For some people, you can never drive the right car. For some people, you can never live in the right area. For some people, your wife will never be beautiful enough. For some people, your kids' achievements will never be good enough. Then why do you try to please them? The only focus you should have is that God is happy with your wife. God is happy with your children. God is happy with you. And God is happy with the choices that you make. Because when that is your focus, you're beginning to go forward in life. You're beginning to leave your past 
behind. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews seems to be in complete agreement with Solomon. And he explains it this way. I'm reading to you from the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us now throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance with the race that has been marked out for us. Now listen to this part. Let us now fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame of it. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He says, you want to know how to run the race? Focus on Christ. Remember what he did. Remember what he did for you. Amen? Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's be very honest. Even when you're running the race of life perfectly, it's not going to be easy. You know, unfortunately, the world is full of people that feel the way to get people to a place of repentance is to promise them heaven on earth. It's to promise them a life that when you give your life to Jesus right now, everything is going to be perfect. You will have no problems. Your car will no longer get 10 kilometers per liter. It will now get 15 kilometers per liter. And you know, I'll make pop like a duck on. But they're lying. Because the Bible makes it very clear, in this world we will have troubles. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. The fact that I serve Christ has not removed trials, tribulations and problems from me. It's given me somebody to lean on. It's given me somebody to focus on to get me through the problems. You know, sometimes we say, oh, I'm stuck in the dwang. And some of you, that's probably where you are right now. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, you would not use the word dwang, but I'm in church today, so I have to use that word. You understand? Being stuck in it is a really big problem. It's better to say, I'm going through it because at least you got focus. I'm going somewhere. I know I'm in a bad place right now, but I refuse to stay here. My eyes are focused on Christ. I know where to go. I'm getting through this. I will not stay here. Listen to me, the dwang is not your destination. It's part of your preparation to get to your destination. It's what's making you strong. It's how God is preparing you for what is about to come. You know, when you join the army, they take you through basic training. It's six months of hell. But by the time you finish there, I tell you one thing, and you know what I'm talking about, right? You're ready for just about anything. And you never realized how they conditioned you. When the first shots begin to ring out, you know how to act, you know how not to react. And you survive. What you thought was going to kill you is actually helping you to live. Now, you see one thing. Look at your neighbor and say, you've joined the army of God. You might not like it, but I want to tell you something. You are an enlisted man and you are an enlisted woman. And when you are in war, Things are not always going to be easy. You see, there's something out there that doesn't like you. We've spoken about it before. It's called the devil. Where God has plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope, to give you a future, the devil has the opposite. He wants to harm you. He doesn't want you to enter into any godly future. He wants you to be disillusioned, frustrated, angry with everybody. He wants you to be a quitter. He wants you to give up. And he plays a role in what happens in our lives. Sometimes we go through difficult times where must your focus be ahead of you who's there christ is there the author and the perfecter of your faith is showing you the way to go jesus himself spoke on this same idea that we're talking about matthew 6 verse 19 to 24 jesus says do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and the rust will destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, 
Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within your body is darkness, how great will be that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, Jesus is speaking and he makes mention of our eyes. He says where your eyes are is going to say a lot about who you are and where you are going. Here we have two contrasts. We have earth and we have heaven. Or earth and heaven. We have God and we have mammon. Jesus reasons that if a man's eyes were to direct his bodily movements, like we saw when he came forward and I asked him to pick up that bottle, the first thing he did was first get focus, get vision. When, once he's dialed it in properly, we go, we take. Now, Jesus says, if a man's eyes were to direct his bodily movements, then a blind eye is a horrible thing as the body will not know where to go. And if we look at this from a spiritual point of view, an eye that is undivided and uh, um, an eye that is undivided, that is honest and zealous for God, will lead to a life of holiness, a life of blessing, a life of prosperity. In other words, from a spiritual point of view, where your eyes are focused is going to determine what kind of a life you are going to live. Does that make sense to you? <coughs> an eye focused on worldly lusts, an eye focused on hypocrisy, an eye focused only on the pleasures of the flesh, an eye that doesn't mind now and then taking the way of evil, can never get you to the destination where God wants you to go. It's going to take you to a place of evil and destruction. Jesus meets a man. We don't read much about this man and there was only one conversation between Jesus and this man. His name was Nathaniel. Maybe some of you know who he was. Jesus is all happy to see Nathaniel. And Jesus says the following in John chapter 1 verse 47. He says, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. You might not see it that way, but Jesus is in a sense rejoicing. He's happy to see Nathaniel. We only read that there was one encounter between them. Maybe there was more, but the Bible doesn't speak about it. But Jesus makes a point to go up to him, to greet him and say, You are an Israelite in whom there is nothing false. What does that tell us about Nathaniel? Nathaniel lived a life that was fully committed to God. He had a single purpose in his life. I asked you just now, where should your focus be? You answered me. To live a life that is pleasing unto God. No, it doesn't say all of that about Nathaniel, but by the way that Jesus greeted him, by the excitement that Jesus had when he saw him, we can see that this was the way Nathaniel lived his life. It brought joy to God. If we live the same life, it will bring joy to God. Um, the Christian life is sometimes referred to or likened to a race. And in order to win, how many of you did sprints when you were at school? Any of you? There we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, all right. Not you. Okay, you were there to cheer them on. There we go. Well, it takes two, you know. One must run and the other ones must say, ho, be in a ho, ho, be in a ho. You remember that at school, yeah. So, here's the thing. If you're going to be running a race, you go down there to the starting point, you go down on your, on your haunches, 
you assume the position on your marks get set go but take a quick look at at the race uh, at the runners when they go down they, they're looking down they're getting into the zone on your marks get set the moment they say get set the the face comes up the eyes are focused what are they focused on finish line nothing else matters I want to tell you something his wife can be there yelling all sorts of insults at him he wouldn't give a hoot because at that moment he's seeing only one thing somebody can be there flashing all sorts of things that would make your eyes pop out he's like not interested right now I've got a purpose that's how we should be there's a lot of things that demand your attention God says be careful where you focus because that's why a lot of people don't run the race till the end that's why a lot of people get stuck somewhere because they shift their focus now the Christian life is a race and to win the runners are warned not to allow distractions to remove their focus from their goal Paul says but one thing I do I forget what is behind and I strain towards what is ahead that I can reach my higher purpose or goal in Christ Jesus. In other words, he says, even though life sometimes wants me to focus on my failures, on the disasters, on what people said about me, on what people didn't or didn't do, I refuse to listen to that. I'm going forward. This is my call. This is my purpose. This is my destiny. Paul says he presses forward. He doesn't look sideways to the right. He doesn't look sideways to the left. Because the prize is the higher call of God. Philippians 3.13 But one thing I do. I forget what is behind. And I strain towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Paul also speaks of those who do not share in his vision. And he goes on from verse 18 to 19 of Philippians chapter 3. And he's speaking of people who unlike him, who have received the vision and who are focused on God and living a life pleasing to God. Those that live for the world. Those who for whatever reason, whenever the chips are down, now we're going to go left, now we're going to go right. Verse 19 speaking of those he says their destiny is destruction their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame in other words you can go read that for yourself and you will see what God is saying Paul says there's only one way for you to have a blessed life there's only one way for you to have a life that will get you from where you are now to where God wants you to be. It's to push everything else away and focus on living a life pleasing unto God. Don't turn right. Don't turn left. And forget what is behind. Let me say something about bitterness and unforgiveness. You cannot be unforgiving about what people are going to say tomorrow because you don't know what they're saying tomorrow. You cannot be bitter about what happens next year because it hasn't happened yet. Therefore, you don't know about it. Every person that walks around this world bitter is living in the past. Every person that walks this world that is full of unforgiveness is living in the past. Which is exactly where the devil wants you to live because you can't have a future if you're stuck in the past. You must understand something. The devil's very clever. He knows that events that have happened are sometimes traumatic. Events that have happened can sometimes cause us to lose focus and lose vision. And he will do everything he can to get you to be in that place. Why? Because then it takes away your future. It robs you of your focus where God wants it to be. Psalm 12 verse 1 to 2 says, Help, O Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, 
with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Now we're getting to something. I do believe that this was written by David. And he says there's something that he's noticing more and more. Now he wrote this like 4,000 years ago. It's a lot more relevant today than it was back then. He says, I'm noticing something. The godly man sees us. In other words, I see less and less godly men. And I see more and more destruction all around me. Evil is prevailing. He says, for the faithful man is disappearing from amongst the sons of men. And he says, where I should be seeing sons of men. In other words, sons of God. Men who are focused on God, who want to live a life pleasing to God. They are gone. Then he says, those same men. Instead of praising God, instead of worshipping God, instead of having something positive to say, they speak idly, everyone with his neighbor. Now, for those of you that don't know, when the Bible speaks of idle words, it's in a sense denoting gossip, slander, and speaking without knowing the facts. Which is pretty much what gossip is all about. When somebody runs to you and tells you something juicy about Pete Pompey's, Nine times out of ten, it's only partially true. When you go and you repeat it, you're pretty much repeating a lie. Here's a scary thought. In the New Testament, we are told that liars are friars. And if you don't know what that means, it says every liar will be thrown into the lake of fire. Gossip is a very dangerous thing because it destroys people's lives. You can take a man full of honor. You can take a man full of respect. You can take a man full of righteousness. You can take a man of God. And you can put one sentence out there that is a lie. By the time the world is finished with him, he's got nothing left. His destruction came because of a lie. And people perpetrated that lie through gossip. And you know what gossip is like. It starts with one sentence. By the time it's at the fourth person, it's a book. It's got 20 chapters. God hates that. He says they speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and double hearts they speak. Why have they got double hearts? Because on the one hand, they profess to be children of God. But when you listen to the overflow of the mouth, which speaks from the heart, they are children of the devil. Wicked men have a double heart. They know God, but they're not committed to Him. They do not live a life consecrated to Him, and they do not honor Him. Their vision is more on the world. You see, he's talking about the people. Instead of looking forward, they're constantly looking to the right and looking to the left. Their vision is more on the world than on worldly things than what it is on God. They are carnally minded Their lives reflect little of the grace of God. And what comes from their hearts is not godly. I want to say something to you. God doesn't have time for hypocrites. Jesus had no time for hypocrites. You listen to the way that he spoke to the Pharisees, you get an idea of how he felt about it. When are you a hypocrite? Well, yes, the Pharisees. They claim to know God. They claim to be the way to God. Jesus called them a brood of vipers. He said to them, you have the keys to the kingdom. The keys to the kingdom is the knowledge and the wisdom that comes from the word of God. He says, you don't enter in. In other words, you don't honor the word of God. You don't live according to the word of God. And neither do you let others. You see, the thing is, a lot of the people didn't want to know God because of the Pharisees. They really had this attitude, why must I be like them? Unfortunately, I wish I I could tell you that things have changed, but today it's still the same because there's a lot of people in this world that call themselves Christians. They are very quick to write on a piece of paper, religion, Christian. Like very proud, Christian. But it's only a bunch of letters on a piece of paper until you live it. God's not interested in lip service. Actions will always speak louder than words. Why 
does David call these people double-hearted? Because though they profess to be one thing, when you look at their life, they clearly something completely different. James warns believers twice against being double-minded. I want to liken that to being double-hearted, which David used. James warns believers twice against being double-minded or having more than one objective for your life. In other words, you can't say, okay, my vision is to, be a, to live a life pleasing unto God. I want to be a blessing unto God. I want to make a difference. But the moment you're in a worldly setting, it's like, hey, hey, let's go. Party on, dude. You know, Wayne's World. <laughs> Movie's too old for you. James chapter 4 verse 8. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The double-mindedness and the double-heartedness run together. God doesn't want no double-heartedness from you. God doesn't want double-mindedness from you. God says to you, my child, if you've made a decision that this is what you want to do, stand by your decision. You know what is said, he who won't stand for something will fall for everything you see that can i tell you what happens you go to church you come under the conviction of the holy spirit the spirit of god is moving and during a sermon or or during a song of worship you come under the conviction my life is not right i need god you bawl your eyes out you humble yourself before God. You lay down your life. You repent of all the things that you have done. You call Christ into your life because you realize you need a Savior. Bless God for that. But the problem is tomorrow you go back to the world. Now it's like, ooh, none of my friends walk this road. They're going to see me as a religious freak. This makes it very difficult. Okay, I know what I'm going to do. When I'm with my friends, I will be like my friends. But on a Sunday, I'll bless God. That's what he's talking about. When you've made a decision, God wants to see that decision. How does God influence men? Look at your neighbor and say, through you. I want to tell you something. Me, I'm a pastor. I know I do have some influence. But you influence a lot more people than me. Because you're out there. You're out there, so shall I say, where take the tear strike. You're out there where people are battling, where people are crying, where people are suffering. You're out there where people are falling apart. You're out there where the devil is destroying people's lives and you have the opportunity to be a light shining in a dark world. Don't think for one second that God doesn't want to use you because He does. But you can't be double-hearted and you can't be double-minded because then you're not useful, you're useless. Which is where the devil wants you to be. James warns us that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Listen to that. A double-minded man, he actually goes so far as to say, you can go and read that in the book of James, I think it's chapter 1 or chapter 2. He speaks about this and he says, a double-minded man is like a wave in the sea. Sometimes you're up and then you're down. Then you're yeah and then you're there. There's no stability in your life. Now if you are unstable in all of your ways, what's going to happen to your marriage? Look at your neighbor and say, unstable. What's going to happen to your finances? Look at your other neighbor and say, unstable. You see, the thing is, when the Bible says you will be unstable in all of your ways, do not take that as... Uh, metaphorically that's the way it will be double minded people go nowhere double minded people battle with even the most simple trivial things because they're unstable James warns us that we should diligently strive to make God our one and only objective If you make a decision to serve God, that decision is not to serve God in church. That decision is to serve God with your life. You don't stop living when you leave the church. You're still living. The light that you allow to shine through you, yeah, must shine through you tomorrow at work. 
It must shine through you when you go to your in-laws. It must shine through you when you go to your friends. And that light is probably going to push you away from certain places that you like right now. But it is glorifying the flesh. It is not glorifying God. It's creating a, a strife within you. It's creating a fight within you. Which is why some people have no peace. Of course. Do you know what caused Eve to fall? Could be a lot of things, but here's the thing. Follow my thinking. Eve was minding her own business. The serpent comes up. He shows her a fruit. Her eyes focus on the fruit. He entices her. What pulled her in where her focus went? Do you hear what I'm saying? She lived a life pleasing unto God, but the enemy took her focus off God and he put it on something else. The rest is history. Genesis 3 verse 6, for in case you think I'm lying. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, she saw it before she tasted it. Her eyes told her, you want it. It's good. There's a lot of things out there that talk to your eyes right now. But when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, do you see that? Why, why is it put in there twice? To show us how the stuff works. And that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit and she did eat. What caused it to fall? That's where her vision, where her focus was. We think of Lot's wife. Lot, even though he wasn't the most godly man, I can bring up a lot of issues in his life. God still had mercy on him. And God said, out of everybody here, you are the one, you and your family, I will save you. And it was more for Abraham's sake than for Lot's sake. But it doesn't matter. Salvation came to them. Angels came and spoke to them. And the angels said to them, when the destruction of God comes, when the hand of God moves against this city, do not look back. Genesis 19 verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt what caused lot's wife what caused her life to cease right there that instant that moment where her focus went the moment it went back her life stopped does that just happen to lot's wife no the same thing still happens to people Day after day. We might be 5,000 years later. But people are still looking back to destruction that happened in their life. And they get stuck in what happened there. And their life slowly ebbs out of them. How many people after a destruction, a, a, a destructive event that came against them or their family cannot get over it? Why? Because that's where your focus is. You see, the thing is, God never said you can't grieve. But God also said, let your focus continually be on me. If your focus is on Him, He's the healer. Healing will come to you. He's your guide. He will guide you out of the place that you're in. But if you keep looking at the disaster, if you keep focusing on the problem, if you keep seeing the hurt, you will never get out of it. Achan was a man who failed. To look towards God and God's provision. Instead, he saw the riches of Babylon and that cost him his life. For those of you that don't know who Achan was, the Israelites invaded the promised land. God sent them to go and fight against a city called Jericho, which had a reputation that it had never been conquered. Probably God was causing the Israelites to walk on a bit of water there. And then God said to them something really profound. You're not going to fight. Walk around the city for seven days. I'm sure in today's society that wouldn't have gone down very well. It's a good thing we were born here and not then. <laughs> now, 
Afterwards, they were warned. Whatever was in the city is consecrated to God. Do not touch it. Do not covet it. Do not take it for yourselves. And here comes a man by the name of Achan. He sees something. I'm going to give you his own words. Joshua 7 verse 21. When I saw the plunder, in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, when I saw 200 shekels of silver, when I saw a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took it. What did he do before he took it? He saw it and he kept looking at it, kept looking at it, kept looking at it. And what happened? His body went where his eyes were focused. That's the thing we have to understand. Where your eyes are focused, where your vision is, that's where you'll end up. That's how corruption starts. The fact is, what caused him to fall? Lack of vision. Lack of the correct vision. David had the same problem. We all know that God loved David. We all know that David was a man after God's own heart. He's called a friend of God. He was a wonderful man. He wasn't perfect by any chance. And um, 2 Samuel 11 verse 2. One evening David got up from his bed. He walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. What did his eyes do? It took his focus from one place to the right. The next thing you know, he had his servants bring her up. Things happened. Problems came. Disaster hit him and his family. What was his mistake? Focus. Vision. Shifted to a place where God never wanted it to be. From this we can clearly see. A life that is focused on God and pleasing God will be blessed. There's no other way. You're going to be blessed. I can't promise you a trouble-free life. I can't promise you a life where there's going to be no trials, tribulations, etc., etc. Because these things come and they've got a reason. But I can tell you one thing. When God sees that in your heart you want to live that life pleasing unto God, you want to be a blessing, God's going to bless you. A life where you look left, right, left, right, etc., etc., leads to problems, destruction, desolation, etc. Psalm 119 says, verse 37, Turn my eyes from worthless things, preserve my life according to your word. Ay, 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 listen to this. I mean, this, I can preach a whole week on this sermon, on, on this, this one verse. Is David. David has now learned his lesson. He knows his eyes caused big problems in the past. His, his vision wasn't good. And then he says, he says, God, please, turn my eyes from worthless things. He's realized one thing. The things that our eyes like to see in the bigger scheme of things is worthless. You know the car the other guy drives? From an eternity point of view, it's worthless. You know the beautiful wife that your neighbor has? From an eternity point of view, she's worthless. You know the big rings that your friends all like to show and, and flaunt? They can't take them to heaven. It's worthless. You know the big position that your best friend has? And sometimes it grinds you when you hear him talking about this and that and all the power that he wields. Let me tell you something. When he gets to heaven, he's not going to have that position. It's worthless. Turn my eyes from worthless things. And then he says, please preserve my life. In other words, he understands something to preserve your life. Your eyes better not be on rubbish. Your eyes can't be to the left or to the right. Otherwise, you're not preserving your life. You're wasting your life. Preserve my life according to your word. There's only one way for us to really be blessed. The word of God tells us what to do, how to do it. It's our choice whether we apply it or not. 1 John 2 verse 15 to 17 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has and what he does, comes from the Father and comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away. But the man who does the will of God will live forever. I go back to a proverb that I want you to remember. Proverbs 4, 25. Let your eyes look straight ahead. You know, when you go to the racetrack, you see some horses that's got these little kapikis. Blinkers. Blinkers. Because the jockey has learned that that horse is easily distracted. And when the jockey wants him to go towards the finish line, he wants to, you know, he, oh, I haven't seen you for a while. We chat, yeah, we chat there. Oh, that's nice grass, you know. He, he doesn't want him to be distracted. Now, the thing is, we can't live our life with blinkers on. I mean, how are you going to look when you've got these things? Okay, some women want to give that to their men. I, I know, I know the, the problem that you're facing, but... The blinker should be the Word of God. You see, when you spend time in the Word of God, you understand the Word of God, you're like, not for me. Not going to go there. Turn my back on it. That's your blinkers. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. And take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right. Do not swerve to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Why are a lot of people's lives constantly in a place of evil? You have the answer there. Because they left, right, left, right. They're not, this is where I'm going. Nothing else matters. So here we come back to focus again. I've said it before, there are a million different places you can focus your vision. Let me name a couple. When you switch on the television, what do you see? Well, we live in South Africa. I'll tell you a bit what we see. We see crime. So many people got raped, so many people got murdered, so many people got hijacked. This is the corruption in this municipality. This is the corruption... In this municipality, these uh, um, uh, ministers absconded with so much money, etc. We see crime, we see corruption, we see evil. Now, I, I want to be honest with you. It's very easy for that to become your focus and for you to forget about God. I want to ask you a very straightforward question. Why are people leaving this country? I'm sure they've all got their reasons, but I want to tell you one reason is because that has become their focus. When God is your focus, you do not fall apart because of what happens around you. God can look after you. Listen to me very carefully. Let me use Daniel as an example. Daniel's friends were thrown into the lion's den because they chose to focus on God. And guess what God did? He locked the lion's mouth. When your focus is in the right place, God works with you. It doesn't matter where you stay. They also got thrown in the fire. You, I don't know if you've ever read that, but there's something that freaks me out. When you go and read that, you will read that the guys that took um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, 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 the soldiers that took them to throw them into the fire died in front of the door. Because of the heat. Yet Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were walking around there like they were having a stroll in the park. Why? Because God was with them. I'm sorry, but don't tell me how bad things are here. Because God wants you to focus on Him. You have a purpose to fulfill. We can't all run away from our destiny. We have to be focused on God. When we focused on God, things fall into place for us. When you start looking at the problem, your focus can no longer be on God. You become negative. You become bitter. You become angry. South Africans have become angry people. Can I tell you why? We used to be known as a people that loved God. We used to be known as a people that had time for God, that worshipped God. 
Today we are religious people, but I don't see that love of God anymore. I don't see that commitment to God anymore. People's focus have shifted. And it's a sad reality. And it's something that we have to deal with in our own hearts. I have to deal with it in the same way that you do. The next thing that becomes a problem and that causes people's focus to shift is the prosperity of the wicked. How many times do I have people come to me and say, Oh, you know, life is so unfair because this one and this one and this one. You know what? I want to tell you something about the prosperity of the wicked. The Bible makes it very clear that it will not last. You know, sometimes God gives people enough rope to hang themselves. But your focus should not be on that. You should not be falling apart because of that. Because your focus should still be on God. Who is your provider? Listen to me very carefully. The South African government does not provide for you. They can't even provide for themselves. But God will provide for you. Amen? Amen. Take whatever company you work for. Put that name there. It does not provide for you. Because God took responsibility for you. And God will make a way where there seems to be no way. You see, this is faith speaking. But the problem is there is no more faith. It takes one newspaper headline to cause a whole country to... Don't tell me it's not true. Follow the Dow Jones. Check the Rand dollar. The moment there's problems anywhere in the world... Why? Because people are no longer focused on God. People are focused on left, right, left, right. What did the Bible say? It leads to destruction. The achievements of others. Listen to me very carefully. There's always going to be somebody that's cleverer than you, somebody that's stronger than you, somebody that's quicker than you, somebody that's more sly than you. And there's always going to be somebody getting to the top before you. If that becomes an issue for you, then your focus is on that person's life, no longer on God. How can God bless you if your focus should be forward? If God wants you to look at Him, if God wants you to live the life pleasing to Him, you see, you can't live a life pleasing to God when you become bitter about other people's achievements. You simply become bitter. Your focus has shifted. There's a lot of suffering in this world, I agree. And sometimes we're like, oh, but if there's so much suffering, God is a God of love. Why does He allow this? Why does He allow that? Yeah, here's your problem. Again, where's your focus? Your focus should still be on Him praying for the suffering. Your focus should still be on Him seeing what you can do to alleviate the suffering. But that's not what the devil wants. The devil wants you to turn against God because of these things. Sometimes we go through difficult times. Raise your hands if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, you know. And let me tell you something about trials and tribulations. They also take your focus off God. Because we come to a place where we just see the problem. It's just problems, problems. How many times do you hear people say, ah, I'm sick and tired. It's just problems, problems, problems. Yes, I sympathize with you because guess what? I go through those times myself. It's not like I don't know what you're going through. But the fact is, can you still focus on God in those times? Because if you can't, you've got a problem with your focus. You've got a problem with your vision. Sometimes what causes us to no longer focus on God is the way people treat us. I don't know what to say to you, but yes, life. Sometimes the people that should have your back don't have your back. Sometimes the people that should love you turn out to not love you. Sometimes those who you thought were your friends turn out to be your enemies. How many people grow up and they don't get love from their parents? It's sad, but it's a reality. It's true. How many children were molested by family members, including a father or a brother? It's horrible when those things happen, but the enemy wants that to become your focus. And a lot of people have no more life because that is now the focus of my life. This happened to me. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Whatever the case might be. But our focus should still be forward. 
You see, when your focus is forward, God helps you to deal with the hurt. God helps you to deal with the rejection. God helps you to deal with the pain. You can't do it yourself. And the thing that wants you to focus on it, which is the devil, he simply wants the pain to escalate. And that's his way of doing it. Oh, here's another good one. False prophets. False teachers. Listen to me very carefully. Just because somebody stands behind a pulpit doesn't make him a man of God. Just because somebody uses scriptures when they talk doesn't make them a prophet of God. How many people today, listen to me, um, you all know that in America in the 60s, I can't remember what that movement was. Some of you might remember. There was this guy who claimed to be a prophet of God and he had all these people follow him and eventually he got everybody to drink poison because now they have to die so that they can go to heaven and who knows what not. It's a way that the devil has to get us to focus on the wrong things. There's a lot of false prophets out there. How will you know them? The Bible says by their fruit and by the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you won't know what you're following. Make sure that you know. And I want to say something to you. Don't just take what somebody says. Check for yourself. The biggest problem that we have is people just follow blindly. And just because somebody walks in and does some kind of a miracle doesn't mean God sent them. Have you ever read what's going to happen when the Antichrist rises up? The Bible says he will even raise the dead. But will that make him God? No. Still going to be the devil. Get rich quick schemes. I'm sorry, but we have to talk about these things. Even in the church, people fall for it all the time. There's somebody out there that wants what belongs to you. He's called the devil. He came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He knows when you're going through tough times. Instead of your focus being on God, it's so easy for these people to spin you a story and your focus goes to this get-rich-quick scheme. Listen to me, there's one good rule of thumb. When it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Turn around and walk away. God is my provider. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. When these people come to you and they put pressure on you, oh, you have to give 10,000 rand by the end of today because this is a limited opportunity, blah, blah, what, what. It's probably a Ponzi scheme. It's probably going to be, the, the carpet will be pulled out from under you. Be wise. Say again? It is limited. Limited to your money. Yeah, it's limited. <laughs> it's limited to you. God's warning is clear. You better be careful where your focus is. Let it be on Him. Do not swerve to the right. Do not go to the left. The only way for you to be blessed and to truly move forward in your life is to keep your focus on God. I'm going to end off with this. You all know the story of Peter. They were in a boat. There was a massive storm. The storm was threatening to sink the boat. They were panicking. They were in terror. Even though they were fishermen, I don't think they could swim very well. And by the way, they used to wear these tunics that hang all the way down there. I think when that thing gets wet, it just pulls you down. It was panic stations. And the next moment, Jesus comes walking on the water. Like he doesn't have a care in the world. Eleven of the disciples freak out and think they saw a ghost. Peter is like, wait, wait a minute. I know that man. That's Jesus. As Jesus comes closer to the boat, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come and I will walk on the water. And I'm sure God was blessed by his faith because it took faith for him to make that statement. And Jesus said, come. And he walked. And if you go and look at that scripture, you'll see he walked on water. Didn't walk very far, but he walked. When did he walk? When he focused on Christ. When did he sink? When he focused on the storm. Sometimes we're so focused on the storms in our own life or the storms in our children's lives or the storms in our country that what happened to Peter happens to us. I don't care how strong a Christian you think you are. When your focus is not where God wants it to be, you sink. The devil knows that. It worked with Peter. He walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, 
ate with Jesus, studied under Jesus, why won't it work with you? Give me one good reason. It still works. Devil's not stupid. Satan is going to do whatever he can to get your focus on something stupid, whatever that might be. Part of your fight is to fight to keep your focus where God wants it to be. Remember, God is your provider. Remember, God looks after you and takes care of you. Remember that a life that honors God, blesses God, and therefore God will bless you. Do not be double-minded. You can't live in the world and live in the kingdom because Jesus said you cannot serve both God and mammon. Choose this day whom you will serve. Did anybody learn something today? Give the Lord a big hand, please.